Smart telescopes are taking over the world and the Dwarf 3 by Dwarf Lab is right at the forefront of the movement. At just $499, it's an incredible value for what it can do and the potential it has in store. A lot of you have asked me to do a comparison of the Dwarf 3 with the Sea Stars, and there's so much that I need to tell you about this telescope by itself. And for the sake of time, there will be a follow-up video where I go over the differences between the Dwarf 3, the Sea Star S50, and the Sea Star S30. We'll go over the hardware and we will look at some of the images that they have all taken on the exact same night. Let's quickly look at what's inside the box. Inside the box, I have a nice carrying case and it looks like everything is inside. It has a nice padded case, speaking to the portability of this unit. Then inside, I have the actual Dwarf 3 unit. It looks pretty nice and there's a speaker and microphone hardware on the bottom. And from what I know at this moment, the hardware for the speaker and microphone is ready, but the software and possibly the firmware isn't yet ready. So imagine in the future, we say something like, hey, Lil D, Find me the Orion Nebula, which would be a really great party trick at star parties. Also inside the bag, we have a USB-C to USB-C charging cable. This should come in handy. And there's also a solar filter. Looks really nice. I didn't get a chance to fully test this out during the daytime, but the solar filter really nicely just plops on. It's magnetic, and you also use this for taking dark frames, which I'll go over later in this video. Then there's also the strap, the microfiber cloth, and the product manual. Quickly going over the specs of the Dwarf 3, the Dwarf 3 has two cameras. On this side here, we have the telephoto lens, which is a 35 millimeter aperture. And on the other side here, we have a wide angle lens, which is a 3.4 millimeter wide angle camera. The wide angle is super handy when it comes to looking for solar system and terrestrial objects. And it's also great for monitoring the clouds. The focal length of the telescopic camera is 150 millimeters, making this side of the telescope an f4.3 focal ratio, which is a bit faster than the sea stars that I'm used to seeing. The focal length of the wide angle is 6.7 millimeters, making it an f1.9, incredibly fast. The sensor in the telephoto lens is a Starvis 2 Sony IMX678 sensor, which gives you a whopping 8.29 megapixel camera, which gives you a resolution of 3840 by 2160 pixels which is very large and very great because the field of view is incredible. This thing comes with three built-in filters. First is the visual filter, which you need for normal daytime photography, followed by an astro filter, which ends into the hydrogen alpha range. And then there's a dual narrowband filter, giving you access to O3 and H alpha. I believe the band pass is 30 nanometers and 20 nanometers respectively, giving the O3 part of the filter access to hydrogen beta as well. This has a 10,000 milliamp hour built-in battery, which is quite large and I'm really happy with the size because it lasts all night, even in the cold. This also comes with a 128 gigabyte eMMC drive built in. So you have a lot of space to store all of what you need. The Dwarf 2, which I didn't use, actually didn't come with built-in storage. So this is a pretty big upgrade, but the Dwarf 2 allowed you to install up to a 512 gigabyte SD card, which I thought was pretty handy. So. I kind of wish this came with both the built-in storage as well as an SD card because that could make it a little bit more versatile, but 128 gigs is plenty of space to last quite a while. Uh, its shooting mode includes regular photography, video, astro, panorama, burst, and time-lapse. And you can also record videos at 4K resolutions at 30 FPS or 1080p at 60 FPS, which is, which is kind of crazy. And one of my favorite features is that this comes with two built-in mounting modes. So you can do an alt-as mount where you just plop it on a tripod, leave it standing as is, or you can mount it equatorially where you're pointing at Polaris and you don't have to worry about field rotation. I'll go over a little bit more about what that entails uh, later on in this video. The exposure time allows you to shoot up to 60 seconds, which is great, but they are currently working on 120 second exposure. I was able to test it. It's a little bit buggy, but the developers are aware of it and it's in process. So 120 seconds of exposures would be amazing because your single to noise ratio for each of the individual subframes would be much better. And the amount of files you need to save and process later on if you do plan on post-processing would be much easier because you're working with far less files. And this thing is tiny. It's only 222 by 142 by 65 millimeter in size and weighs just 1.3 kilograms. Now let's quickly talk about my favorite feature of this thing, which is putting this in equatorial mode, which is built in, comes out of the box. And as far as I know, the Dwarf 3 is the first and only smart telescope that supports equatorial mode out of the box where you know you don't have to use any third party software or anything that kind of tricks the mount kind of tricks the telescope into thinking that it's in equatorial mode although i believe the sea stars are working on it they're still lagging behind the dwarf 
So the quickest way to do this is to put it on a steady tripod and angle it towards Polaris. So I'm using my Skywatcher AZ GTI equatorial wedge and it fits perfectly. And once I set it to look north and run the equatorial setup in the app, it does a few calibration images and it tells me what, my, what adjustments I need to make in order to get close enough to polar alignment so that it can do its thing. And it can automatically adjust if you're very slightly off. So you have to be within the range that it needs. And since we're in equatorial mode, there's no need to worry about field rotation. So you know that all most of the pixels, most of the photons you're getting in your pixels is just gonna stay that way. You don't have to worry about wonky corners. Although this thing does dither automatically, you'll have some artifacts at the very edges, but it's totally worth it because dithering will help a lot with walking noise, as well as any kind of thermal noise, especially if your darks aren't perfect. So my second favorite feature of this is the planning mode. I actually first tested this out in a Twitch live stream. I'm a Twitch newbie and I thought I could stream this and have that footage ready to show in this video, but I did not save it. So. That video is gone, but I can tell you that the planning feature is pretty handy. And when you have it enabled, you tell it exactly what to find. And when the time hits, it'll turn on or become awake again, find the object, do all the calibration steps, turn on the filter if you ask it to, start imaging it, and then finish when you ask it to stop. The only thing required for the planning to really work is that you need to make sure that you have the initial setup and calibration done correctly. So if you want to use this in equatorial mode, make sure that you are polar aligned before you start your planning feature because otherwise the dwarf will struggle to find what it needs to find and it may not work. Another cool feature this thing has that gets it closer to a traditional astrophotography setup is the ability to take dark frames. We can't take flat frames. I'm sure you can rig up something that lets you take dark frames to get rid of any kind of vignetting, although this thing doesn't have any from any of my tests. The dark frames gets it closer because now you're taking calibration frames so when you're post-processing along with your lights you can indicate what dark frames you want to include or dark frames you don't want to include and and have it processed that way and to take dark frames as i said you just install the solar filter you turn this down all the way and then you turn on the dark frame mode within the app and let it do its thing it might be a little bit more helpful if you put this in a dark area and not like my room here where i have a bunch of lights on so that there's no kind of light leak. And you can store up to 10 different dark frame configurations, which includes exposure time, the gain, by the way, something that you also have control over is the gain, which is incredible, as well as the temperature. So this thing is not cooled. So you may find yourself taking dark frames every so often when the temperature outside changes because you need to be within a certain range in order for the dwarf to apply the dark frames to your images properly. So you want to make sure that the temperature is kind of kind of similar. So it's, it takes me back to my DSLR days when at the end of my session, I used to have to take some dark frames to make sure that the light frames and the dark frames temperatures are kind of aligned. And the dwarf stores all of the dark frames in its folder, all neatly organized. Super cool. Another really cool feature that this has is the ability to do wide angle astrophotography with this 3.6 millimeter wide angle lens at f1.9. I think which would be excellent for things like star trails, meteor showers, maybe aurora, and of course the Milky Way galaxy. I'm really looking forward to Milky Way season with this because I think it would be incredible. And I'm doubly looking forward to comparing the Milky Way that I get with this versus what I usually get with my DSLR and Star Tracker. So all the different types of astrophotography you can do with the wide angle camera will probably get its own dedicated video as I slowly start to work on those. I already briefly mentioned the file storage system here and how neatly it organizes it. And I really like how it does it because we have different sessions for the same objects and they are really neatly and very cleanly organized. On top of that, the Dwarf 3 also saves any kind of failed integrated images so that you can decide for yourself later on if you're stacking and post-processing that whether or not you want to include them. A lot of the frames that I've seen that it discard are actually frames with star trails so it was rightfully discarded so it's great seeing that the dwarf 3 is correctly discarding frames so that it saves me work but it's also really nice to see the frames that were discarded so that i can so that i know exactly what's happening and that's one of the things that the c stars don't do is that once it f fails that file is not saved. Next feature that i really like about this is the mosaic mode. I believe that's a pretty recent feature too. 
And we've seen a couple of images where the field of view that we get with the 35 millimeter aperture at 4.3 is really wide, especially with the 8.29 megapixel sensor. And the mosaic mode is essentially lets you capture larger objects without having to invest in different telescopes. And here's an example of the Rosette Nebula in mosaic mode. It's not quite complete, but I had enough data to stack and process this. It could use a little bit more saturation. I'm planning on adding a lot more data to this in the future, but seeing the mosaic mode work is really nice and it works really well. And I'm really excited to continue using mosaic mode. And as you should know, when you're taking images in mosaic mode, the signal to noise ratio on different parts of your picture will be different because they're not getting the same amount of data coming from the dwarf. So if you shoot something for like an hour, it's not going to be exactly an hour all across. Maybe the center frame will have a lot of, the center pixels will have a lot of overlap so that that could be an hour, but just keep in mind that an hour in mosaic mode is not an hour of actual data. The last amazing feature that I'll be talking about is the ability to edit or make curves adjustments to your live stack images as it's stacking. And making adjustments to the curve on the fly can help you make your images pop in live view, which I find really attractive, especially for my outreach if I ever take this to one of my star parties. And all the fine adjustments are pretty easy to do. The one difficulty I had with the curves adjustment with my chubby-ish fingers is that making super fine adjustments can be really difficult on a small phone screen. I had a little bit of an easier time on my bigger iPad, but, but most of the time I'm usually on my phone looking at it and making curves adjustments is a little bit difficult. So see if I could submit a feature request to Dwarf Lab on the UI is to give us the ability to maybe have a maximize button where we click on this, the curves now takes up the whole screen. Maybe we can zoom in, maybe not. And we can make fine adjustments to the curve on a larger screen instead of a tiny screen within a screen. But it's not the end of the world. I was just really excited to see it and use it. And if you attended one of my live streams uh, back in December where I straight up had the Dwarf 3 go up against the S30, you saw me make those fine adjustments live in the stream. I talked a lot about all the things that I like about the Dwarf 3 and a little bit about the curves adjustment that I think could be improved. But here are a couple other things that I think could be improved to take this telescope to the next level. I like to use all of my telescopes, not just my smart telescope, but my traditional rigs as well, from the comfort of my home which means I like them connected to my home network so that they're in the backyard near one of my routers and I'm here on the other side of the house in my basement office and I can look at stuff on my phone, on my iPad, on my computer screen. And when the Dwarf 3 is in station mode and it is connected to my home network, I can be 70 feet away and be using it. However, the Dwarf 3 has a limit of about 10 meters or about 33 feet for the wireless connection, which isn't too bad, but in the winter months, I have some pretty thick walls in the backyard the Wi-Fi signal has a really hard time getting through the walls. So I have to make sure that it's much closer to my house, which means I have to put it in a more awkward place in the backyard, but that's okay. A second, however, is I found that when it gets really cold outside, like super cold outside, it has a much harder time communicating with my home router. And by super cold, I mean about 20 degrees Fahrenheit or about negative six degrees Celsius, which is within the operating limits of this, but it has a really hard time with the Wi-Fi signal. But if I'm right next to it with my phone and iPad, I can connect to the built-in Wi-Fi network of this and, and, and use it pretty well. But that still kind of defeats the purpose of me wanting to do remote astrophotography with this in the backyard and me inside my house. So the last few times where it was super cold, as soon as it lost connection is when I just let it be on its whatever it was planning to do and then just packed up when it was done with that. So I'm hoping in the warmer months that the Wi-Fi signal performs a little bit better with this because especially when we can open our windows, uh, let some more of the Wi-Fi signal seep through instead of having to go through the walls. And if that's the case, expect more live streams through the Dwarf 3. Second improvement that I wish upon the Dwarf 3 is something that the team is already working with is the ability to adjust contrast, brightness, and saturation on the live stacked image while it's stacking. It's currently not possible to do an astrophotography mode, which is fine since we do have access to the curves adjustments and we can adjust the individual RGB colors on the curves adjustment as well. But it would be really nice to be able to up the brightness or the contrast, especially when I'm trying to do my outreach and I wanna make very quick adjustments just to show people on the screen what I'm looking at. The next improvement I would like to suggest for the dwarf is improvements to the sky atlas when we're reframing. So for example, if we're looking at an object in the sky, you know, we can see the object name at the bottom here, 
pretty clearly because that's what I'm pointing at. But if I want to reframe it just a slight amount, just move it a little bit, we can see that now the target is the next closest star, even though the deep sky object is what I was trying to point to. It's not the end of the world, but it makes organizing the files and the images later on a little bit annoying, especially if I'm trying to image something and then now the folder is no longer named, like let's say the Jellyfish Nebula. It's now HD, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I don't have all the stars memorized, so something I have to look up or look at the stacked image to see what I was actually trying to image. And I didn't know it was doing that the first time around until I tried to put the images on my computer for post-processing. And I was wondering what all those folders were with the star names because I wasn't aiming for those. But again, not the end of the world, but it could be a pretty big improvement when it comes to organization. Next improvement I would like to suggest is with the live stacking. So I know the software and the firmware are still being developed and the potential that this telescope has for creating amazing images is unlimited. But from my experience so far, it seems like it takes a lot more integration time in order for details of deep sky objects to really start popping on the screen, especially with the dual narrowband filter, which actually isn't that much of a problem with the C-Star. So I'm sure that it could be fixed a little bit more or it could be improved with some software and firmware updates. So having the ability to see like almost instant satisfaction with the images I'm taking is kind of essential for me for my outreach activities especially when I'm at like schools and the kids want to see something within, you know, like four or five minutes instead of 20 minutes. The images can look a lot better once they're post-processed because you take all that data into like Serial or PixInsight, you stack it yourself and you process it yourself. It's a lot better than any live stacked images. I've said this many times on my channel before. So to conclude this video, I think that the Dwarf 3 is an excellent telescope, especially for beginners. And in fact, I think that in terms of smart telescopes, the features that this has is actually closer to a traditional astrophotography rig. For example, this has out of the box equatorial mode, which is amazing, which is what most of our astrophotography rigs tend to be. And of course, this gives you control over aspects like the exposure time and the gain. The gain is pretty sweet. Uh, it doesn't give you access to the offset, but that would be another level. I don't know if they'll be, ever be able to do that via software or firmware, but Having access to the gain is huge because we can control the dynamic range that we have access to on the sensor itself and how quickly we're willing to fill our ADUs. That's, that's, a, that's a little bit of a technical jargon uh, that I'm not going to go into, but Queef the Lazy Geek has a really nice video on ADUs and offsets and gain. And of course, the ability to take dark frames, which is just one of the three types of calibration frames that we can take, is also huge because especially for beginners when you're learning to post-process and stack the images yourself. If you're just stacking lights, you know, you're just picking one thing, but having to work with darks and being aware of temperature is, is pretty big and a big learning step when it comes to a traditional astrophotography rig right, where, where, where darks are almost necessary. Of course, there's ways you can get around them, like with a pretty aggressive dithering and really good flat frames. Again, it's just a really great teaching tool, I believe. And of course, stay tuned for a video coming up really soon. Comparing the Dwarf 3 with the S30 and the S50, we'll take a look at images that I've taken, we'll compare the hardware, and we'll talk about just how similar and how different these are. If you have any questions about the telescope, please let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and until next time, clear skies. To take this telescope to the next level.